Good morning, everybody. Before we start, I'd like to uh, pay um, um, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to the elders and to their um, descendants. Also, I'd like to say good morning to all of you out here and those who are watching on the live stream today, who includes my own mother. So, hi, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I've got a lot of ground to cover today, so what I will do is keep the introductory comments rather brief. Um, for those who don't know, the Public Record Office of Victoria is the archives of the state government. And so when we are talking about the topic today, land, we are talking about public records that are defined in the Public Records Act. It's a piece of Victorian legislation that dates from 1973. And in this context, we are going to be talking primarily about records created or received by Victorian government departments, by statutory authorities, and by councils. Now, the great majority of those records are stored um, within our main repository at the Victorian Archive Centre in North Melbourne. And we have a reading room there. And in the three decades or so of my career, I've spent a lot of time um, in the reading room dealing with queries for members of the public. And this question here... <laughs> ..is one of the hardest, if not the hardest, question to answer because it's a question that is impossibly, it's impossible to answer yes or no. Basically, it is maybe. And to get to the point where I can say to someone yes or no, I might need to ask any number of questions, which is all aimed at testing the quality of the information that you have. And there are reasons for this. First of all, and let's be perfectly plain about this, Within the records of government, there is no one record that exists which is going to record the details of every single piece of land and every single person that's ever owned that land and every single person that may have rented out that piece of land. It just doesn't exist. It makes it very important that before you start, and certainly before you start talking to us, that you should accumulate whatever information you have about the land that you might be interested in question. Even if you don't know where someone may have possibly been, it's vitally important that you have at least an idea because if you limit yourself to just Victoria, the number of records that we can point you to is going to drive you, frankly, batty. And there's a reason for that as well. And that's because land records are being created by bureaucrats in the public service. And in most cases, the focus they have in creating those records isn't on the people involved. It's actually on the piece of land that is the subject of a transaction. So you always keep that in mind. And in fact, you can see that even further. This is my characterisation of the sorts of records that we have in our collection. By far, the, the, the bulk are records relating to the management of Crown land, government-owned land. The government's, well, the land under the control of the government's probably the best way of putting it. And that includes making arrangements to people to lease land or to licence it out, or in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, to use the term to enable them to select it. There will be records that document activities relating to the sale or ownership or the valuation of privately owned land in which case the focus there is very much in relation to people in terms of the owners of the records, not necessarily the people who are living there. It's the same thing that applies in relation to the records relating to the charging of rates by municipal councils. On ratepayers, it's on the owners of the property, not necessarily the people who, living, who live there. And of course, for those records that relate to the regulation of land use, such as um, planning schemes, the names of people, 
completely relevant and is barely documented, if at all. And the one thing that we don't have at all in any sort of systematically documented uh, manner are records that relate to privately owned land that's owned by private individuals or companies who have leased that land out to another private person or organisation. So if I own a house and I rent it out to someone, there isn't going to be a record created in the government's records about that transaction. However, of course, you might find records as an incidental byproduct of other government, prop, uh, government functions. So, for example, if I lease my property to somebody else and they refuse to pay rent and I take you to court, there might be a court entry in a court register that might record that. But, of course, for you to be able to find that, you have to know when that case occurred. You have to actually know that there was a dispute. And that becomes a very difficult task for people. So, I know at the moment I'm making things sound pretty difficult. I'm making it sound as though, hey, why should we even try? Why should we even start? But the message I want to get across today is that at PROV we've been trying to think about different ways of doing things, of simplifying the ways in which we um, present information and to take the opportunity that the internet provides us to try and coordinate a number of disparate sources and pieces of information that we have available and to bring it together in one overall package. And so, over the course of this year, we have been progressively publishing to our website what we are calling new content pages, in which we try and do all of those objectives and put it together so that you have a bit of a one-stop shop so that if we have um, records that have been digitised, then we can provide you with immediate access to them within the context of the guide pertaining to the broad topic that we've identified. And if they've not been digitised, we're going to try and put them in a way in which we can take you straight into our catalogue so that you can start to identify specific records that you can use to look at in the reading room. And the two key pages that I'm going to take you through today are in two topics called researching land and property and researching your house. Keeping in mind there's a lot of overlap between the two topics and it's very hard to actually work out um, whether one thing belongs under one topic or the other. So in many cases we've actually hedged, hedged our bets and pages will appear under both. I've also tried to simplify the way in which I've been going about presentations. From here on in, most of this presentation is going to be screenshots that I have uh, produced from the content pages and the things that they have led you towards, and in some cases not. Um, but in many instances, I think it's important to keep in mind that what I am presenting in most cases is not going to be the totality of the screen that you will see when you embark upon this journey because if I was to do that, there'd be lots of little small writing and hardly anyone would be able to see things. So I've expanded on many things. I've also put arrows, like the ones that are up on the screen at the moment, with the yellow writing and the black wording and the, the red outline, um, which includes comments that I've raised and made to make things a bit more visually understandable. So let's start our journey. Let's start with the PROV webpage and the homepage to the webpage. That address in the top left-hand corner that I've added there is prov.big.gov.au. Now, there are lots of different things on that uh, page, but the, uh, the key thing that you want to click on there is here. That says Explore the Collection. When you get to the Explore the Collection page, and this is by no means the entire page, there are a number of places that you can go. Now, if you've never used our resources before, my advice is go here to where to start. To do a number of things, learn about what we do, why we do it, how we differ from a library, but more importantly also 
to log in and get yourself um, uh, effectively what librarians would call a, a reader ticket. If not, and you've done all of that, go here to explore archives by topic. Now, and when if you click on that, you start to get a much bigger page than this. I've cut out all of the guff that appears right at the start, which explains what, what it all is, because I wanted to show you as many of the pages as possible that uh, appear on, on that screen. And you can see there that the very first six ones that are there are the biggies. Wills and probates, family history, passenger records and immigration, AKA shipping lists, researching land and property, research in your house, inquests. And then there's a whole stack of other pages down below in alphabetical order. So what we're talking about today are two of the big six. And we're going to start by talking about researching land and property. This is the top bit of the researching land and property page. Um, you can see there are lots of links built into it and lots of information, which I'm not going to try and regurgitate here. But there are a couple of things I want to point out from this page. First of all, what do I need to know before I start? So on every given page, there will be something to that extent, telling you at least the minimum piece of information you might need in order to make the best out of the resources we're making available. But this bit here, view online or in the reading room and looking for this icon. There are two issues here to keep in mind. First thing is, not everything in the prop collection has been digitised. We have a collection of 102 shelf kilometres worth of records. It's going to take a while. Um, so, to help people, you will see on many pages and in many parts of the catalogue, you will see an icon like that with a, with a mouse, which is indicating that you're looking at a record that's been digitised and a book, or open book, or open volume, is indicating, oops, is indicating a record that exists in hard copy format at the moment only. It'll probably mean you'll need to come into the reading room to look at them. Further down the researching land and property page, you will see, in turn, a number of other pages. And this is where we've broken down that topic into a number of smaller digestible chunks, each of which with its own research journey, each of which leading to different things. And so to kick this off, we're going to start with this topic, the historic plan collection. Now, this is from the page relating to the historic plan collection. Once again, I've taken away the, the top bit of the, the page and some of the bottom part is not there either. But what you're looking at here is the historic plan collection is a collection of records that was put together by the old division of survey and mapping. Um, and it brings together what they considered to be a lot of the really significant cadastral plan collections of, of maps that the government and have produced as a result from the survey process. And it's effectively a number of different sub-collections put into an, to one large collection. And the sub-collections that exist within that are quite fascinating. You've got plans that were created in the very early days of Melbourne and the Port Phillip district that were sent up to Sydney and then eventually returned back to Melbourne. There were plans relating to the proclamation of roads. There were plans relating to the establishment of the old telegraph routes. There are plans relating to uh, the routes taken by various explorers through um, uh, Australia, uh, Victoria's and Australia's history. Um, and many, many others. The important thing about the collection is that each plan has now been identified and is searchable within our website, but not everything has yet been digitised. We're in the process of digitising and going through and we continually add to that, but that's going to take a while. 
doing plans, as you can imagine, especially the size of some of these, can be quite time intensive. But what I want to show you is this. Once you get to a specific page like this, you will see either a single green box like that or a succession of green boxes on the same page. And here we are creating special search boxes for you to be taken straight into our catalogue and to find individual records of interest. And what we've done is we set it up in such a way that if you follow the instructions that we've given, it will search across the things that we have identified. So in that box here, if you put in a parish name or a township name or even a locality name, it will search across automatically for you um, every plan listing that we've got in the historic plan collection. So there's an example. And to test this out, I'm going to demonstrate it. Because I'm a willy boy, I'm going to put in the word Williamstown. And this is a search result that will typically come up. Um, and just to show you how powerful this sort of searching can be, you can see up here we've identified 59 plans within historic plan collection that has the word Williamstown in it. More importantly, we've been able to set up filters within it. So along here, we set out the time frames in which those plans were created as dated in the catalogue entries. And we're even telling you of those 59 plans, how many exist in hard copy and how many for which there are uh, digitised representation on the website. Now these are all filters. So if you click on any of them, you narrow your search down to just the numbers that are identified there. But as the first three that came up were all hard copies, and I was interested in seeing what I can find online, I decided to hit on the button that says digital. It says that there are 18 plans and to see what would come up. And this is what came up. This is a refined search result. As you can see, it's now listing just the 18 digitised plans for Williamstown, broken down into that date range. And as you can see, we've now got the digitised icon appearing on the screen. All of these are the identification of a particular plan or record within the catalogue, and it is a link to it in the catalogue. So I decided to click on this one. We're look at the, looking at those references, I know that, that what from that designation there, CEM means that this is a plan that somehow shows a cemetery within Williamstown. It's just the area of the cemetery, not individual plots. But I've put this one in because this is what happened when you click on it, when you click on that link there. It takes you straight to the catalogue entry in our catalogue for that particular plan. And you will know that it's been digitised because right there you've got the link that says PDF. And by clicking on that, you will come up with a PDF image of the plan. Now, here's the surprise. When you click on this particular plan, you get this. And this is something that happens in the historic plan collection from time to time. The people at the Division of Survey Mapping sometimes took a number of different plans, completely unconnected, except that they're in a, a number order, and they paste, and because they were small, they were placed on a backing of a single uh, sheet of paper. And so obviously we're not going to cut them up. So what we've done is that even though there were 10 different plans on the sheet of paper, we've indexed all 10 plans as though they were individual plans. It just be that when you click on the link, you will get all 10, because that's the record. Now, oops, oh, you, too early. That's the plan that we were looking for before. I notice there's another plan from Williamstown in here as well. I think that's showing another cemetery. But I also noticed this. This was, and which if I went looking for it, I would have found it as well. Here's a nice plan of Williamstown. I thought, oh, that's nice. So what I thought I'd do is, I thought I might work on it. So what I did is I cropped it. Um, 
and I cropped it from that image, I did it online, I brought it up. The image here is, I'm terrible with computers. People know this. This is a documented fact. The message here being that if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and I want to show you this. I kept this one deliberately because, you know, oops, I've spoiled this. These are too small. <laughs> you notice it's a bit blurry because I, I, I wasn't quite au fait with it. So I thought, no, I'll keep the blue image in. But what I thought I'd do is I'd go back, do it a little bit proper, bring up the uh, image, focus it up a bit more. And then what I did is, I don't know, hit screen, uh, screen um, print screen. And then from that enlarged image, I got this. And just look how sharp the image is that we've been able to bring up. And this is me doing it. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm thrilled uh, uh, about this. Uh, and I'm thrilled for a, a, a few reasons, because it does show you exactly the power of digitisation. In many instances, when you have a digitised image, and I can appreciate the fact that people like to see the originals, but you can get such a richness of detail from a blown up digital image that is going to be far better than having the original in front of you. And you can see here, doesn't really matter where, you can see the names of all the people on all the blocks. Uh, they were probably the people who purchased them at, at auction, I would imagine, um, as well as the details of other infrastructure. And I notice uh, on this plan here, you can just see evidence of changes in the local community over time. Uh, you can see here that Roman Catholic Church and school, uh, the school is St Mary's of the Immaculate Conception, where I went, and the church is St Mary's uh, in Williamstown. But today, they're actually reversed. Today, the school is in the area where the church was, and the church is now in the area where the original school was. So that shows you just what you can do and find out when you look at some of these maps. But the focus here is on family history. You've got the names of the people here, where else can you take it from there in terms of that sort of research? Well, as I've written at the back of the bottom of the page here, we have records relating to the sale of Crown land. And what we have are the records that were produced going all the way back to the Port Phillip um, district and the police magistrate that were record results of um, sales and land auctions that had occurred all over the state, or all over the Connolly at that point. And the main series is the series we've got there, reports of land sales by public auction, the information of which was derived from other reports that we also have in, in custody. We haven't produced an online page yet for it, but probably will at some point in the future. But just to, just to show you... Uh-oh, it's happening again. Oh, no. There you go. I just thought I'd show you the first page of the first volume showing the very first land sale in Melbourne, dated the 1st of June, 1837, and you can see how the first two blocks purchased by one J.P. Faulkner, and further down, a bloke by the name of John Batman. Um, fairly significant people, and you can see, how about this, the corner of Flinders and King Street bought by John pa Pascoe Faulkner in 1837, he paid £32. I'd hate to think <laughs> what the percentage increase in that today would be. So that's it for the historic plan collection for the time being. Let's talk about quickly about pastoral runs. As you know, these pastoral runs, they're the big squatting runs that were more or less illegally occupied um, before the campaign to unlock the land occurred in the latter part of the 19th century. And once again, I've brought up a segment from the page created to the pastoral run, records that we have. And what it is telling you is that in order to find the records that we have, you're going to have to need to know the name of the person, either the person who owned the run, or the name of the pastoral run, or the parishes in which the pastoral run was located, uh, which means um, 
just basically getting an idea of where it's located. Um, however, if you don't know any of that, we've created links to other things that are here that will help you work that out. Here, there are links to a number of different maps that we've placed that show different parts of Victoria, and it shows you where all the different um, runs were located, and of course, with their names. Um, you can also uh, find out the names of runs from that wonderful publication, Pastoral Pioneers of Port Phillip by Billis and Kenyon, and we even have registers relating to pastoral runs but you'll probably find that that's probably going to be the thing that helps you. And you get your detail, you get your name of your pastoral run of your parish, and once again, we've put a little search field box there in green, whack it in there and hit, hit um, press, and that will take you through to links in the catalogue. But in a section of the page that's down here, I thought I'd blow it up, that says next steps, please note this. The pastoral run plans have been digitised and can be viewed online. The pastoral run files have yet to be. So keeping in mind that you can look at the, the, the plans online, but you have to come in the ready room to look at the files. The hint there is that the pastoral run plans, that's a subset of the historic plan collection. So you can also find such plans by just going into the historic plan collection and typing in the name of the plan into that search box. But we'll move on to the biggie, parish and township plans. As probably everyone knows by now, parish and township plans put together by the Division of Victor um, uh, the old Department of Crown Lands and Survey, and they set out parishes within Victoria or townships. It sets out the allotments and sections uh, that are the parcels of lands within those areas, and and it records a lot of information in there, including the name of the Crown grantee who'd obtained the land, either by uh, uh, at auction, at public sale, or as a result of a land selection. And in fact, many people come to these plans because they want to get the land selection file number. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If, if you don't know the names of any of the parish and townships, once again, we've created links to maps of parts of Victoria that will show you where all the parishes are located and what their names are. Um, and and, um, and, um, and you can do that. And there's also a list of the parish and township plan, plan names and numbers that we've also got that you can, you can look up as well. And you need that information in order to do your search of the plans that we've got digitised, keeping in mind that in some cases there's going to be more than one plan for a parish because the parish was so big they needed to create two plans to cover the area adequately. If you click on the list of parishes and townships, you will get this list, give you the names, and it gives you the number that if you choose you can put in to the search field. To help you out, things that have been grade, identify townships, the rest of the parishes. Sometimes something will be in yellow. And that's for a parish that doesn't have a plan. Because sometimes, you, and it even exists today, some parishes, uh, parishes are so sparsely populated that there's no sense in creating a parish plan for that area. And you'll actually find the details on the county plan, which is a much greater uh, aggregation of areas. So what we're going to do is, once again, do a, uh, a typical one. I'm going to type in the parish of Eyre. Once again, click search. Once again, uh, I've left out the search results on this, on this occasion, just to save some time. Remember, catalogue, PDF, Here's the plan, and this is the entire plan as it would appear. Now, the plans we have digitised and available are what's called working plans. These were the plans that were actually worked on in the district land offices. Um, and the set that we have had given to us, which is digital only, were created at the end of the paper plan era when the office in Bendigo, I think it was, 
organise the project to get all of the working plans from all over the state lodged with it and digitised and made available to everybody. And so you will find there's a great deal of colour on these plans that you don't find on the official township and parish plans, um, which are known as the, the regular plans or the put-away plans, which Lands Victoria have digitised and you can find on their website. But, and if you want to understand all of the markings on a, on a parish or township plan and what they mean, um, oh, sorry, on a parish plan only, um, we have placed two documents, there are two documents there, how to read a parish plan and an example, a sample of a parish plan which will explain what a lot of those things mean. We've also put in a link to our lands guide, which we'll talk about briefly in a minute. And you'll need that if you want to then go from the, land, from the parish plan to the land selection file. Briefly, here's a blow up I've created of just one um, parish plan. There's the identifier of the, of the property, allotment 10 of section four. There's the name of the, the grantee, L.C. Parker. And here are the dimensions of the land that had been selected. Now, you notice there were two sets of um, areas there, acres, roods, um, perches. The, that figure is the total holding of that selection. Where you have it in brackets, what it means is that that is the holding of just the area that is on that you are looking at. So what that is going to mean is that there's about another 45 acres to the sky, which is elsewhere in the parish. You've just got to know where to find it, and you will find that it will have 45 acres in brackets around it. But what you really need to find, if you want to find the land selection file, is the land selection file number, which is in the form of a fraction. The, top, the bottom number, meaning the section of the Act under which that land was ex, um, selected, and that's just the application number, a running number within that. Some parish plans give you even more detail. In this particular case, not only do you have the name of the Crown grantee, but also the date of the grant that's been uh, recorded. And on this occasion, there were two file numbers, but one's crossed out. Now, where you have something like that, what that is probably meaning, and I've seen this happen over and over again, is that something has happened in the selection for that property, which has meant that even though it may have been selected under that, that Act, or what the, the provisions of that Act, that has been cancelled, it has been re-established. Section 12 would have been uh, Section 12 of the 1838 Closer Settlement Act. So my guess is, well, not my guess, I would think you will find that in that particular case, they've kept the crossed out one on there, not just because they were updating it, but it was a way of saying to them that these two numbers still represent one file. It's just what's happened is the file number has changed. So don't go looking for this and this as separate files because if you find that, you'll probably find that. A township plan can look fairly different. Here's a blow up again from a plan that shows parts of Bendigo. Um, and where they do differ, of course, there are no land selection files and because they've been bought at auction, there is no selection. It becomes someone's private property right from day one. But what you get, once again, the name of the purchaser, the dimensions of the property, and that's probably the uh, auction date. A land selection file, broadly speaking, documents the Crown's management of an allotment of Crown land. So the way to look at these is to think about the government being a form of landlord and this almost being like a tenant file. Uh, broadly speaking, you select land under a Land Selection Act. The idea is, you know, you pay a certain amount of money, you increase the value of the property up to a certain level, and then if you do that, within 
the allotted time is set aside in the Act, then it becomes your private property. If you succeed in doing that, that is when the file ends, because then the relationship between the government and that piece of land has ended, um, and they are no longer managing that block. It's no longer Crown land, so there's no requirement for them to keep adding to the file. But sometimes, of course, and this happens especially with the World War I soldier settlers, sometimes um, the selector doesn't make a go of it, has to get off the land because they couldn't make up the payments or whatever, and it could be that that's how the file ends, or it could end, or what might happen is it might be transferred to somebody else, and if he maintains the conditions of the original selector, the file continues, it's just that the person on the land is different. At the moment, we don't have a content page specifically on land selection files because it's a bloody difficult one to have to write for a whole stack of reasons. We have numerous series of land selection files because the way that they controlled those at the Department of Crown Lands of Survey was that there was a separate filing system for every different section of every different land act under which people could make application. So, to tr and not only that, the level of detail we have in the list of those series can vary. The ways in which you can get file numbers other than parish plans can vary dramatically. In some cases, we might have an index. In some cases, we could have the register only. In some cases, we could have the index and the register. In some cases, we'd have none of them at all. So to try and write a page that tries to take all of those situations into account is, is a fairly difficult one. Um, but we are trying our best to overcome it. And the first major attempt to try and do that war, and to take account of all of those dif differences was, and still is, the Lands Guide, which is now something that has been out for seven or eight years now. Um, but to give you an idea of just how much the variation is, whoops, 434 pages long. So try and narrow that down into one or two pages. Um, but fortunately, you can read it online as though it were a book. So you see this little thing here? If you click on that, it'll actually open up. And if you keep clicking, it'll open, open the next page, page, page. It becomes quite addictive over time. And so it's an, it's an online resource that you can actually use as though you were going through a book. One of the other things we're doing is, over time, we've been using our wonderful award-winning volunteers and also previous catalogues that have been created, and we are gradually entering those in to the online catalogue where they didn't exist beforehand, which means that for a number of the land selection series now, but by no means all of them, there is a great degree or degree of contact, of content, so you can do some searching based on the person's name or the file number or even the dimensions of, of the property. But in all of those cases, it's going to take you only to a hard copy file. What you might find in a land selection file, anything at all relating to that relationship between the selector and the, pro and, and the government. So here you've got, this is just from one typical file. Uh, this is a, that's a typical file cover summarising everything, obviously showing at the top of this page that the grant was sent to the Office of Titles on that particular date. So you know how this file has ended, the person has been successful. Um, there's the uh, application for the, for the allotment, including the district surveyor's report, application for lease, another inspector's report. And if you're, and if you're really lucky, if the selector was literate and wrote a letter into the department, you'll find that on the files as well. One sub um, feature of land selection files are soldier settlement schemes. One of the things we need to make clear to people is that there were soldier settlement schemes after World War I and World War II. So there were two completely different schemes. They weren't one scheme. And a number of people I've met over the years have think that there was only one. There were two. Um, and as part of our contribution to the ANZAC centenary, what we did is we created a massive database called Battle to Farm, 
which relates to the World War I scheme, identifying the diggers that got land selections. And we needed to do that because so many of those files relating to the discharged soldier settlers are actually buried in files of other people because so many of those soldiers actually walked off the land. So, you know, that case where, where it's, the file may have started with one file number and ended with another is really applicable here. So this was something that really needed to be done. So, if you come down here, and we're searching land and property, soldier settlement schemes, this will take you to um, the uh, Battle to Farm homepage, uh, in which, lots of information there, but here you can search by name. So all you need to do is whack in a surname, and for the purposes of this example, I used the word Smith. <laughs> 124 of them, but not necessarily 124 surnames of Smith. This is the reason I picked it. You can even see that if the surname is, uh, you know, one of the given names, it'll pick that up as well. And so for each of those is a link to that person. So I'm going to pick this guy completely out of random. And then this is the Battle of the Farm entry for that person in which you get the identification of it, what do the files tell me? All links. Um, if you want to see the original paper file, that'll take you to the catalogue entry so you can order it. Now, it's very important that you do so because even though there are digitised images here, it is not the totality of the record for that individual. We only had enough time to do a heightened selection of key documents, but if you want to see the whole thing, order the, the hard copy file. And as an extra added attraction, we collaborated with our colleagues at the National Archives of Australia, and I love this. See the soldier service record goes to discovering Anzacs. So you don't have to move far to click on a link that takes you into the NIA website and to the guy's service record. I think this is a, a taste of things to come. Okay. We've only got a few minutes left, so we'll better speed on. Now we'll talk about private property, and in particular the researching your house page. That's where that's what the home page for that looks like. And one of the resources that you'll find here is the historic home research guide that we produced a couple of years ago. And fortunately, it's only 32 pages long, but it does work on the same basis when you can flip through. Uh, through that, and it's full of great useful information. There's even what I especially like is the page which shows photographs of typical houses and it gives you an indication of the sort of um, house that that is, you know, whether it's a federation house or something like that. Um, now, on the researching your house page, this is, uh, I've brought up just the, the pages relating to it, and we're going to only talk about a couple of these very quickly. First of all, certificates of title. Um, as everyone knows, the Tohan system of titles, the current title system, was introduced in 1862. And what we do point out here is if you have your volume and folio number, you can come into our reading room and you can log in to the um, land titles website. But what if the land was originally uh, bought in the period of time before the Tohan system came into place? Well, those were subject to a system that was known as common law title. And basically, the way that used to prove title in those days was that you had to prove title going all the way back to the start of the house. So when you purchased a property, not only did you get the property itself, but you got the whole chain of documentation, deeds, etc., that go all the way back for any number of transactions up to the time that that property was first, first sold. And what we have in our collection is this series, the applications for certificate of title. Now, when the Tohan system came into play, provisions were put into there to say that if you have common law title, then you can make an application for your common law title to be converted to a Tohan's title. 
And what that meant was you had to fill out an application form, you had to send it into the title's office along with all of that chain of documentation that had been accumulated beforehand. And then if they were happy that you've proved that, they would issue a Towans title for that property. The only problem was that that Towans title only began from the moment the Towans title was created, not from when the property was first bought. So we've kept all the application files because that's the key evidence within them of property ownership beforehand. The records are arranged according to the application number. There are indexes that you can look at, but you have to know when the person applied <laughs> to, for the conversion, which is very hard to determine individually. But I do know that you can find application numbers on the interactive maps at Land Victoria. I've tried to find them in preparation for today, but failed, so that's why I'm saying contact Land Victoria. Um, but if you get it and you order the file, this is just the con contents of a typical file. This is what you'll find within them. You know, conveyancing documents, mortgages, you know, newspaper uh, uh, things uh, in relation to the, the sale, a whole, anything that was relevant to the purchase or proving title of that property. Rate records. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think so many people out here have probably used rate books before, other than to say, once again, we have created a search field in the rate books page that searches against all the different rate book series we have. And once again, it's very hard for us to talk about rate books in any particular logical sequence because when the, when the Act first came into play, it said, thou shall be a rate book created every year by a council. The only problem was, as time went by, they got rid of that, and, they, and even the requirement to create rate books um, uh, every second or third year um, came into play. So what we have in our collection, we have annual rate books, we have, um, we have rate books in the form of cards, we have rate books in the form of computer printouts, we even have the form of rate book that's effectively called the uh, Register of Rateable Properties. So what we've done is to create a search field that goes across all of the rate series we have, irrespective of how we titled it, because at least the word rate appears in each one. Also, note here that there are some rate books for which you can look at digitally on Ancestry.com. And so, once again, I relied on Williamstown. I typed in, I started to type in the word Williamstown. A lot of that options come up when you do that. Make sure you pick the one that is for the Williamstown Council. And when you do that and hit search, different series come up first. And you can see, and I've done that deliberately to show you, you know, there's a summary rate book, register of rateable properties, rate books. So it doesn't matter how we've characterised it, you'll, you'll find that. Um, and then what will follow after all of the series are individual records that we have, individual books and whatever. So, to get to individual books, instead of just typing in the name, I've decided to put in a year range, clicked on search, and voila. You can see how individual rate books for individual periods of time that are created. And you can see here that with the Williamstown Council rate books, you've also got the other great variation that is in place, and that is that some councils created a single rate book that covered the entire council area, and others created individual ones for each ward or riding within the local government area. Uh, once again, you click on... If you click on a record like, like this, where it's a hard copy only, what it'll do... It'll get you to the catalogue entry. This button here uh, will be enabled. If you click on that, then you've, if you're starting the process to order the hard copy record to view in the reading room. And just a typical rate book. This is from the 1905 Flemington and Kensington Borough rate book. You can see entries go in a rate number order, but in this particular rate book, you've got the names of the occupiers, which you don't, that you don't get in every rate book, and the owners 
in this particular case, O, o and O, obviously owner and occupier. And you can also see, you can even see here, the occupier has changed during the course of the year, being, being, um, being uh, rated. And you can also see that they've done it street, street. That's the order within the volume. But it says Farnham Street, north side, Danglish Street, east side. Now, even the order within rate books can vary dramatically. In some cases, they'll be alphabetically by the name of the street. And in cases like this, it appears to be like a weird random order. But if you actually have a map of the area in front of you and you start tracing it, you'll find that you're actually going in the order in which the rate valuer or collector has probably gone. So he's gone, you know, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And in the end, he'll cover the whole, the whole area. And it's important because once an order is established within a rate book, they maintain that in subsequent years. So if you know where to find it in one book, you'll probably find it in that same space in others in the years to go ahead. Two quick things, and, uh, and then we'll finish. Valuation registers we have in common, we have in custody, which uh, is a very underused series. It was created by the Office of the Valuer General, and it recorded details about the valuations of properties only, and it was done for land tax purposes, and the detail came from the council rate books. They are a wonderful resource because it will record sale prices, dates of transfer, where the cash all terms was involved in the sale of it. Sale detail is generally not recorded in rate books. Once again, put in a town, suburb, region or parish in there. And here's an example I put in Ballarat here. And you can see you've even got volumes that relate uniquely to things like flats as opposed to just um, houses and things like that. Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works plans or survey plans. I'm not going to go into great detail here because I know Sarah Ryan will talk about these as well. Um, these were created by the Board of Works just after they came into existence in the early 1890s. Um, and what they did was one of the first things they did is they sent teams of surveyors all over the Melbourne metropolitan area armed with survey field books and they went and did these surveys. And then when the survey books were completed, they sent them to the draftsman's office at the MMBW and they created these gigantic plans, 40, foot, 40, 40 feet to one inch. And as you can see, they set out the streets, they set out the allotments, they set out the properties on those allotments. I've used a, one of the plans from inside the, the CBD of Melbourne. And one of the things about it that is so great is that the the plans will show you details of buildings that are no longer there. So the Melbourne Athletic Club stables, the Alexander Theatre, there's a church there that I don't think is there anymore. But these plans, as distinct from the ones at the State Library, the State Library has the published versions of these plans, the lithographs. We have the originals. The originals were subject to change throughout the next 50 or so years until they were withdrawn. And you can see this. You can see where they've bleached out bits because the building that was originally there has been demolished and a new one has been placed in its, in its, in its, in its stead. Um, and so if you know how to read one of these plans, you would be able to find the original survey field book that we have in our collection and see the drawings for the building that has been demolished. And also, our maps contain a key that explains all of the, the figures uh, that you might find on an entry and even gives you the codes, which tells you what those buildings are made out of. So you can see how the, there's the hatching marks on these. If you link it up to that, it'll tell you what those buildings were made out of. Um, and what you're looking for is something like this, the grid that appears on each of the plans that we have, which was never put on the lithograph copy, the published copy, which gives you the field book numbers. So somewhere on there, there's, there is a field book number 288, there's field book number 288, and there is a drawing of part of the survey that was done for part of that particular plan. Also, amendment details. 
are on the thing as well. So if a specific building was demolished and a new one put on, this will tell you the field book number and a description of what the, the amendment was. In some plans, they even give you the page number in the field book. Uh, to start the process of ordering, put in your area in here. Um, it will give you a map entry book, which is like a code. And when you click on one of those, it gives you this. And, every, and it's divided up into a number of numbered plans, which this shows you very clearly. So map number 4364 through 4365. But I'm going to pick this one, map number 254. You can see the streets and that underneath that. Then you go back, use the, the step, put in the number, and then you get some options. Make sure you click on the one that relates to the, the plan number, which is what those are. Unfortunately, it also picks up 254s that appear elsewhere, which are irrelevant for the search. So just keep looking out for that. And, and as you can see, the icons tell you you can only see the hard copies in our collection. And if you want to go to the survey field book number, note the number of the survey field book, uh, put it in there, and then you can order that up. Which leaves us with just one quick thing to say. This hasn't got anything to do with family history, but if you're ever stuck in a situation whereby you need to prove something about a planning scheme, and I know sometimes it happens to people, we now have the planning scheme records right up to 2007. So if you ever get in that situation and you need to be looking at planning scheme records, come to this guide and it will put you right. Uh, I don't think we'll have time for questions. I've gone slightly over. Um, uh, so if you want to ask any questions, I'll hang about for lunch. So um, come and see me then. Thank you very much.